Okay, uh, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the Tomcat Center Innovation Showcase. Uh, my name is Matt Cannon, and uh, let me say on behalf of the uh, Tomcat Center team, uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I know there are a lot of uh, familiar faces, uh, friends of, of the center, people we've worked with before, uh, as well as many newcomers. Um, we're really happy to have you here. We're really uh, pleased uh, to see the enthusiasm for this event. Um, for those of you who haven't attended an innovation showcase before, I'm just gonna give you a one minute uh, primer. Um, basically, this is your chance to learn about uh, exciting new startups and ventures that were born at Stanford uh, and that are addressing markets that impact energy and sustainability. Uh, the teams that we feature uh, were previous awardees of uh, what's called the Innovation Transfer Program at the Tomcat Center. Um, basically, this program is designed to provide uh, resources and mentoring and networking uh, to teams that are seeking to commercialize uh, innovations or business model uh, inventions or business model innovations developed at Stanford related to energy and sustainability. Um, there's a uh, competitive application and review process. Um, it's, it's always open. Um, it's for those of you who have uh, ideas uh, that you seek to uh, commercialize related to our mission, I strongly encourage you to, uh, to reach out to myself or Brian Bartholomew's uh, or Donica Sarlia. Um, we, uh, we just recently launched a uh, shiny new website um, and uh, in doing so updated the um, statistics for the innovation transfer program. I can't help but highlighting uh, a couple of those. Uh, so the program was started in 2013. Um, we've uh, awarded a, a total of $5 million to 81 teams uh, over the past eight years. Uh, those teams have gone on to raise uh, more than $720 million in follow-on funding. Uh, the companies uh, that have uh, started from those teams now employ uh, almost 1,000 uh, people uh, with more than $100 million in annual revenues. And there's been five uh, acquisitions. Um, this is really just sort of one perspective, uh, I think, on the, on the impact of the program. Uh, again, what really uh, unifies uh, all of the teams that we've supported is that they're tackling um, a, a hard problem related to, to energy and sustainability. Um, so we started the um, Innovation Showcase uh, just about one year ago uh, when we switched to, to virtual uh, events. Uh, and it's really been, uh, I think, a, a, an upside of this uh, new mode of, of inter interacting for the center. It's been uh, well received in our first two, uh, our first two events. And really the, uh, the idea is um, basically today you're gonna hear from, uh, from three teams. Um, they're gonna present um, for about 10 minutes, tell you about uh, their ventures, what they're doing. And then there'll be a five minute period for question and answer. Um, there's a Q and A feature in the Zoom. Um, so as you're listening to a presentation, if you have questions, um, please put them there. I will do my best to capture as many questions as possible uh, in the Q&A session. I undoubtedly will not be able to, to uh, ask everyone's question. Uh, I think for the, the companies, the best outcome for them today is to connect to um, new people who can help them build their team or find new customers or partners or investors. Um, so I really strongly encourage you to uh, reach out to them either directly um, or through us here at the Tomcat Center. We also have a LinkedIn uh, Tomcat networking group that we would love for you to, for all of you to, uh, to join. Um, and uh, that's a great way to connect with uh, the presenters and the teams today. Okay, so without uh, further ado, uh, today we're, we're hearing from uh, uh, three ventures that are really addressing markets that, that actually span most of the landscape of the country, um, from farms to highways, to urban areas. Um, we're gonna start with farms and our, our first venture is called Farm Raise. Uh, for those of you like myself who don't know a whole lot about farms, I think one surprising fact to set the stage, uh, as of 2019, 
Uh, there were a little over 2 million farms in the United States, uh, together spanning nearly 900 million acres. Um, that's from the uh, US Department of Agriculture. Uh, in a single line, Farm Raise is the one-stop shop for farm grants and loans uh, informed by and built for farmers. Uh, we're joined today by the founder and CEO of Farm Raise, Jace Hafner. Jace, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. And it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I have to say that we were so fortunate to receive the Tomcat Innovation Transfer Grant when we did, because that capital was really catalytic for us in getting farm raise off the ground and testing its commercial viability. So it's just so grateful to be here today um, and delighted to, to share farm raise with you all. Um, our mission is vital farming communities. So when we think about vitality in farming communities, whether urban or rural, we think about um, equitable access to finance, profitability, and resilient ecological outcomes. So that's what we're shooting for at Farm Raise. Um, and before I dive into farm raise, I really want to introduce you all to the person who got me into farming, which is my dad, uh, Jay. And we uh, we operate a 160-acre Angus beef cattle farm in Virginia. And um, as a kid, I just remember how his, his, how hard he was working all the time. You know, his, his days would begin and end in the darkness. Um, he'd go out at 5 a.m. in the morning. If I was lucky, I would catch him and get to go with him as a kid to check the cows. And then he'd go work a second job doing construction, which paid our bills. Um, like so many farmers, he had a second side hustle to keep us profitable. Um, and then he'd come home in the evening and finish up the farm chores and it would be dark. Um, he was always exhausted and there was very little bandwidth in the day or with, really with energy levels to attend to the finance side of the operation and business development, um, applying for certifications that could help us capture a better premium or direct marketing. There, there was just so much that we could have done that we just didn't have time to do um, in terms of the financial aspect of our operation. Now, that changed um, as I became a teenager. This is me growing up on the farm, was really involved in the farm. Um, and when I was a teen, we started to learn more about uh, resilient, I think many folks call this regenerative agriculture practices. Um, and we started to learn about different funding opportunities that we could access to make these practices possible for us. Because a lot of times these practices require significant upfront capital to get the ball rolling. And uh, my dad was now at more of a place at his other job where he had more time to attend to this. And, and we went through the process of applying for a couple grants from the US Department of Agriculture in the state of Virginia, which paid for us to change how we grazed our cows. We previously grazed our cows in one paddock throughout the year down so that the land was going down to brittle stubs. Um, and this grant that we got gave us seed capital so that we could install new water systems, new electric fencing systems, and begin to rotationally manage our cows so that we moved them around the paddock throughout the year. And we started seeing benefits in year one um, as the grass was much healthier, our soil health was much higher. Um, and what was cool is this had a huge impact on our profitability as well, because the grass was so healthy, we could graze the cows outside for three additional months throughout the year before we had to buy hay inputs and, and truck those onto the farm. And so this was not only a huge environmental win for our farm, it was also an economic win. Um, and going through that process, we learned a lot. And one of the biggest learnings that came out of this is it's really hard to access finance as, as a farmer. Um, and this is, you know, the lens that really spurred farm raise into being. There are three different aspects that are broken in the farm finance system. The first one is there's no one place that a farmer can go to understand what funding options they're eligible for. You know, the, this information is scattered across the internet. You can call up one USDA loan officer and they'll tell you one thing and then maybe you'll get someone else on the phone next day or they won't answer your call. It's, it's really, really hard to get to the bottom of what grants and loan programs you can apply for. The second piece is once you figure out what you're eligible for, then you have the process of going through, if you're applying for government funding, an eight to 30 page application with a lot of complicated paperwork. Um, I went through this process again for my family farm a couple years ago, 
and I couldn't understand it. I had to call someone else to help me walk through it, um, which was which was interesting. And the third part is the, the application process itself is really inefficient. It requires a lot of stops and starts. Sometimes you have to call someone on the phone to help you through it, or you have to wait to hear back from them. It's not a one-stop smooth process. And so this discourages a lot of farmers from completing their funding applications. Um, and this is a problem. This is a huge problem because financial access is really important on farms. Um, it, there are three main outcomes that it, it supports. The first one is regenerative agriculture. You know, these practices that farmers are learning about that improve their land and also increase their profitability. You know, there's a great study that came out a couple of years ago that showed if you, you do these practices correctly, they can increase your profitability by up to 80%, depending on what biome you're in. It, these all these practices re require upfront seed capital. And so getting that in the door is key to scaling up conservation practices. The second piece here is profitability. You know, you definitely need to get some seed capital in the door to be able to invest in your operation and expand it and make it viable. It's crazy that the median farm income in the United States, it was about $300 in 2019. In 2020, it's projected to be a little over $700. So you can see why so many farmers have an off, um, an off farm job that help, helps them to keep, keep the ball rolling. Um, and then finally, farmland, Conservation is a big part of this picture because when a farm is in economic decline or trouble, a lot of times what will happen is a farmer will sell. Um, they will often sell to a commercial developer instead of passing the farm down to another farmer, often the, the child of the farmer, but it can be just another operator. Instead, this farm will be converted to commercial development. And that's sad from losing a farmland perspective, but it's also really bad for carbon emissions. You know, those types of uh, conversions can release a lot of carbon into the air. Um, so for all these reasons, it's really important that we support financial access and agriculture, but there's not a lot of it today. And that's why we're here. We aim to make it really easy for farmers to know their best funding options and then to access those funding options through a one-stop shop. Um, I am excited to show you how we work. So today, any farmer can come to our site and they can check if they're eligible for the top three USDA funding programs. Uh, two of these are conservation-based funding programs, uh, one some, same, same program my farm, my farm accessed. And the third one is the Farm Sur Service Agency Loan. These are great for beginning farmers, farmers who have trouble accessing credit, farms who want to invest in conservation, and they have really low interest rates but the application is like 30 pages long. So um, they can check their eligibility and if they're eligible, they can then apply through FarmRaise. Um, and we shepherd this process in a way that we keep them on task. It's kind of like the gamification of having a to-do list with reminders um, as well as simplified language and um, eliminating duplication so that farmers don't have to fill out 30 different forms. Our goal is to have every farmer complete their app in less than 20 minutes if they do it all in one sitting. Um, so what we also have noticed is that farmers, uh, this we're, we, we we're building and we have built a tech enabled product. We're a tech forward company, but farmers also want to know that there's a person behind the technology who's, who's there for them. And so we've put a lot of effort into creating personalization and making sure that farmers know there is someone you can call. Farmers can set up office hours with us. They can text us on demand. Um, farmers love texting because they're often on the go. And we have, you know, we continue right now. We have a thousand farmers who are free users on our platform, about a hundred who are subscribers paying us month over month. Our office hours are never fully booked, but farmers love texting us. They really, really love that. So um, that personalization component is important. Um, and also introducing you to our founding team. Um, we have a lot of really uh, sort of uh, experience that spans lots of different sectors um, from Amazon and Microsoft and Apple to um, farmland investing to working at Land Lakes and the US Department of Agriculture. Um, Sammy, um, one of my co-founders, we, we met at, at Stanford through the joint EIPER, Stanford GSB program. And then we teamed up with Albert in the Pair VC Summer Accelerator over, over the summer. Highly recommend that as an accelerator program. Um, it was fantastic for us to, you know, just getting to meet someone else to join our team through that um, and so many other benefits. But we're actually no longer a team of three. We're now a team of six full-time um, and we're, we're looking to hire actually a product designer now. So one quick plug to all of you um, connected folks on there. We, we would love if you have any suggestions for product designers to send to FarmRaise. Um, 
we have a really ambitious vision for the year ahead um, of you know the farmers we we're we're working with. We aim to get 500 of them through this common application for the top three funding programs. We're actually right now the the MVP we have online today is um, is, is it's functional, but it's it's not you know, where we want it to be yet. So we're going to launch a farm raise 2.0 platform in two weeks. And so we're pumped to get that out. We're going to get 500 farmers through that. Um, and then two things that we're working on that we'd love your help with. Uh, first and foremost, we're actually in conversations with the U.S. Department of Agriculture right now to run pilot projects um, that would allow us to, to, to connect private capital investors who could invest alongside the USDA for monetizable conservation-based projects. Um, so that's one thing, if you know impact investors who want to dir directly invest in farmers, particularly through debt, we would love to, to speak with them. And the second um, thing we'd love help with, well, really, this is the third counting the product designer. Um, our, one of our go-to-market strategies is agribusiness supply chains. You know, big companies like Danone and Cargill, they've made these great commitments to wanting to improve soil health and sustainability in their supply chains. And so the type of funding we unlock for farmers is really in line with that. Um, and we actually just launched a partnership with Corteva and Granular last week, and we are looking to launch more of these. So if you know folks who are connected in uh, big agribusiness supply chains that are hoping to make the more regenerative, we would love to speak with them. And so I will, I will again leave you with our vision of vital farming communities. This is uh, our farm um, in Virginia. Thank you again and welcome your questions and conversation. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Jace. It's wonderful to see the personal connection to the, to the company as well. Um, lots of different areas for uh, questions. I guess I'll, I'll start just around this idea of the um, the practice, the regenerative practices, and sort of the know-how around you know how to improve sustainability of farming and also improve profitability. Is that knowledge out there? And it's and it's purely a a sort of um, hurdle of getting the right capital to to make the the changes. Are all farmers aware of what can be done, or is there some education involved that's sort of saying, hey, here's an opportunity to change your practices and also uh, you know improve your economics. Yeah, uh, I, th I think education is always part of the puzzle and it will continue to be even as these practices become more and more mainstream. One of my favorite things to uh, watch when I want to get a pulse on what the mainstream farmer is thinking is, is farmer YouTube. Um, it's <laughs> really taken off and sometimes it's just hours of farmers like planting stuff in their fields and, and they're talking on their into their phones and it's almost like this uh, real time on the tractor moment but what we're seeing in a lot of these like so across social media now is is an increased awakening and awareness among farmers about the opportunity that conservation practices present and uh, what's so interesting is this um the way that farmers talk about it, they're not talking about it in terms of climate change so much as uh, profitability and soil health. Um, so it's, I think it's really important for those of us who are thinking about going into policy and, and wanting to mitigate carbon emissions through policy. When we talk to farmers, the language we use is so important um, because it's, it's wild, but most farmers demographically in terms of like the, la the latest I've seen is still the majority of farmers don't believe that climate change is human caused. Um, so we have to, we have to be mindful with how we talk about it, but there's definitely an increased awareness of these practices being beneficial, but absolutely education has a big role to play. Yeah. And I guess it relates to my next question. So, so do you, how do you advertise? Do you connect primarily through social media or, or how are you getting the word out about, about farm raise or, or is it just sort of being passed along naturally from, from yeah. you know, one farmer to another? It's a lot of word of mouth for sure. Um, I'm in a lot of farm Facebook groups and I just post our landing page there and then farmers share it, they comment on it, they give great real-time feedback. So we found that to be a great go-to-market, but um, I don't think that's necessarily a sustainable go-to-market. And so that's why we're really bullish on um, partnering up with agribusiness supply chains that have access to you know hundreds of thousands of farmers across the US. And, and the, the private investors, do, do you think, what's sort of the, the potential there relative to the government funding? Do you think that that could, that, that source of funding could rival what's available through the USDA or, or what's sort of the scale of the opportunity there? 
Yeah, I think it actually could be incredibly synergistic. Um, what's really interesting with uh, you know the two most popular conservation funding programs with, at the USDA, they're actually three times oversubscribed, three to four times oversubscribed. So only about 25 to 30 percent of farmers who apply for these programs in a given year actually get the funding because there's just not a lot of funding out there. And a lot of the, the projects they want to undertake, like improving their water systems, uh, energy efficiency, regenerative grazing, these are actually... These these could produce financial returns. And so my dream is to find a really streamlined way for investors to directly connect with farmers. Um, yeah, the, there's a great soil wealth report um, that I read a couple from, I think it's from 2019. And I, I think there's great information on there showing how, you know, today they're over, I, th I think it was between, uh, forgive me, I, I can't remember the exact number. I think it was over $30 billion in vestible strategies that are here in the U.S. for regenerative ag. And if we could just deploy some of that directly to farmers, that would be great because the USDA's budget is only around $5 billion annually for those. Wow. Okay. And and so how does how does this work logistically? Someone signs up for your you mentioned a subscription or or is it is there sort of an option where you you pay for help with one application or what's can you give us a little bit more on the business model there? Yeah, so farmers sign up at tw it's twenty bucks a month um, to access the common application. But we're actually seeing that farmers are, are just as, if not more interested in signing up on a month by month basis because we are building out this comprehensive farm funding database and we're tracking all these programs at the state, local, federal level. And we send updates to farmers who meet the eligibility requirements or who we suspect meet the eligibility requirements for different op options between um, all these different, you know, levels of funding. And so we give them updates and they sign up because of FOMO. They don't want to miss out on a single funding program. Um, and so our, our dream is really to eventually incorporate as many of those programs as possible into the common application so they can continue to apply. But what we like about the updates is it makes the business less transactional and more of a community. Okay. And um, you have a small but, but growing team. So can you give us a perspective? How long did it take to get to your minimum viable product in terms of, you said yourself that, you know, going through one of these applications is incredibly complicated. How did you distill that down then into this um, virtual assistant that can walk somebody through that? Yeah, um, I mean, the first MVP was a type form. And then uh, we got some, <laughs> some Tomcat funding and we were able to actually, you know, build an application over the summer and a couple months. And now it's been, I think, three months um, since we launched development on Farm Raise 2.0, which will be that 20 minute experience. Um, and we're just, we're just so excited to push that out there and start getting farmers through it. Um, so that's, that's what we're really gearing up toward now. Awesome. Uh, Jace, thanks again for, for sharing the story with us. Uh, it's tremendously exciting and uh, best of luck in, in all of your uh, endeavors for this next year. So thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, so uh, now we're we're moving from uh, farms onto uh, to roads and factories. Um, so our next venture is called Indrio Technologies. Um, one of the problems that uh, they are addressing is uh, emissions from diesel engines. Um, and you you may not know that uh, on road diesel engines account for uh, almost nine percent of uh, U.S. CO two emissions. Um, so in one line, uh, Indrio makes laser-based sensors for rapid monitoring of uh, chemical concentrations and harmful emissions. Uh, and we're joined by the founder and CEO, uh, Rito Sir. Rito, the floor is yours. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'll share my screen now. Hi, um, my name is Rito. I'm the CEO and founder of Indira Technologies, and we are a proud uh, Tomcat uh, company. And Tomcat, I have to say, has been very helpful over the years. Like we got the fund. Initially, the direct funds helped us a lot. And then um, also over the years, the, the incredible interns we get every year, they have added a lot to our products over these years. And we're very helpful uh, where we got a lot of this uh, help over these years. Um, so the leadership team uh, consists of myself and Terry. Um, we both did our PhDs at Stanford Mechanical Engineering at the Hansen Group. Um, 
our ba background is um, laser-based diagnostics in combustion. Uh, so we bring a lot of expertise in how to make these um, laser-based chemical sensors for measuring in very extreme environments and making them survive extreme conditions. Um, so fundamentally what INDRIO does is we close the control loop for chemical reactions. So this is the fundamental principle uh, we act on. Um, and the science we use for doing so is uh, is a method of uh, sensing using laser absorption. So in our method, uh, we have a laser beam that can go through a medium. And then when the laser beam goes through this medium, um, it can get absorbed. And this absorption can be then interpreted to um, understand how much of that chemical is done in their volume. Um, and the, there are, many different unique um, value propositions that we bring to the table. Um, some of them are, uh, our sensors are calibration free, so we can um, make them so that it, once it is out of the factory, it's, it's there and it will never need to be calibrated again. Um, it is portable. We can reach very low sensitivities of chemicals and we are about 10,000 times faster than traditional techniques, uh, which is great to have. <laughs> and uh, we, um, sometimes we can even measure these chemicals um, without having to sample any of it. So this is a great advantage in many applications where we started from and many more, which I cannot get, get to right now. So if you want to think about Indrio's interaction with its clients, uh, it's, it's such as this. So we have these cli clients who have some sort of reactor which uh, produces some chemicals um, and uh, they have some way to control this reaction. So they have these control variables that they can uh, control. And what INDRIO does is um, it measures the, uh, the molecules that are produced from this reactor. <clears throat> and uh, we can give this information to the, uh, the clients where they can use these uh, measured concentration uh, to be able to control this reaction. You can imagine that this is a very broad platform type uh, thing. So it can be applied across many different applications, including um, uh, like food and agriculture, process uh, control, energy utilities and healthcare. But right now we're focusing on this piece of the pie uh, transportation. So just to give you some background about what we are thinking about. So we are thinking about decarbonizing the entire uh, energy and um, mobility uh, sectors. But when we look at heavy duty transportation, this is a very uh, like focused view of uh, like electrification specifically. Um, you can see that even though there is a lot of growth in um, battery manufacturing, um, the even in 2030, it will only be creating about 1.17 terawatt hour towards the commercial electric vehicles. And when we look at the total energy need from um, these heavy duty sectors. And we look at trucks um, and th this will require about 30, uh, 30 terawatt hours per day. Um, so if you take these numbers and take this into perspective, uh, we can only meet about 0.5% of heavy duty demand by 2030 and 16% by 2050. So the takeaway message from this is that we still have to do a lot of things to try to reduce the emissions from um, heavy duty uh, sector just from the way it is and um, maybe trying to use some other biofuels or electric fuels. So ICE engines are here to stay in the heavy duty sector and we have to clean it up. And <clears throat> in that regard, so there, uh, if you think about that system perspective, uh, our client, uh, one of the clients that we have is the state of California. So we are, um, if you think of it in a very broad way, like government, the government has all this enforcement mechanism that like they can literally give people tickets and get their trucks fixed. Um, and <clears throat> what they're trying to control is the pollution that's coming out of vehicles. So what we are doing for them is that we are measuring the uh, pollution that comes out of the, these trucks and then we inform that to the government, which they can use to enforce these regulations. Um, so we have created this uh, sensor called Zephyr, 
um, which is the first of its kind sensor that can measure these chemicals at these levels and the speed that is required from these uh, uh, tests. And we are establishing an enforcement infrastructure that gives uh, the state of California tools to enforce these regulations so that they can catch the, the biggest polluters on the road and help them fix it. And so even focusing down on individual trucks, um, they have the same uh, structure. So you have engine controls that controls the engine, which is basically a reactor um, and converting the fuels uh, into uh, the different end products. So there, what we are doing is we can directly measure the emissions coming out of the truck. And then we can inform the engine controls to um, change its uh, state to perform in a certain way. So given that, and there is this problem of trucks um, having this issue of trying to balance between uh, something called NOx and carbon trade-off. Um, so NOx stands for nitrogen oxide. And this is the main reason we have smog across many different sectors. And uh, this is the reason why we have about 9 million deaths from um, fossil fuel burning. So it's, it's a major reason for um, public health distress because of fossil fuel combustion. Um, and because of that, it's a very heavily regulated molecule. But what happens is the current emission control technologies reduces the efficiency by about 10% today. Um, so this is what we're trying to change. Um, we have built this sensor that will go inside the truck exhaust and we are uh, naming this sensor called Ignis. Um, and we are partnering with some of the biggest OEMs in the world. And we are also getting funded by uh, National Science Foundation to build these sensors uh, that will go inside trucks. And these have very unique uh, properties. And that lost 10% fuel efficiency that I talked about before, that was lost due to uh, NOx emissions control, we can give them back that 10% lost efficiency. And that directly relates to about $6,000 in revenue for every truck driver in the US. And if you multiply the number of truck drivers in the US, this easily creates about $21 billion in added revenue every year for the truck drivers. Um, and we can clean up the smog emissions by 90%, which is a great um, advantage of this technology. And of course, there are other uh, things that are, that are inside truck that reduce the engine life, and we can we can also reduce them, uh, reduce their use, and increase the engine life that way. And we don't need any change in fuel behavior or engine type to do this. So this is something that we can do with the existing system with no changes required. You just need to put our sensor in there and then it will talk to the other parts of the existing system and then it will change its working pattern. And this is the lowest hanging fruit I can imagine to reduce a bunch of carbon emissions and um, also NOx emissions by a large degree. And also going forward, we, uh, we hope to work with electrofuels and biofuels and of course that will have a much lower carbon impact going forward. But those, those still have um, NOx emissions that we need to reduce. So what we're looking for is mentorship um, for high volume uh, design for manufacturing. Um, we are also looking for new product line introduction help. We're currently raising a seed round, which is about 50% full. So if you know anyone who is interested, please let me know. Yeah, thanks. Uh, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can email me at this email address here. Uh, otherwise, I'll be happy to take any questions. Terrific. Thank you, Rito. Um, you made engineering sound so easy. <laughs> um, and I, I, I realize you've uh, you know, removed a lot of the sort of technical detail. Can you explain a, a, just a little bit more on this emissions reductions with the Ignis um, product at the end? Mm -hmm. so, so what is it about the current controls that lead to that lost you know, mm -hmm. 10 inefficiency in the, the combustion engine yeah so primarily there are two things right so actually what happens is a lot of the bad actors uh, they know this and they uh, make these engine tuning parameters change like the in injection timing specifically and 
um, and some of these other things you can do like the amount of EGR, uh, EGR is exhaust gas recirculation. Um, so if you do those changes, you can actually get more performance and more efficiency out of existing trucks, but you're not supposed to do that because it releases more NOx, but you, you have all these people um, in the black market doing this for them. But that aside, but th there, are, there are these um, engine performance domains where you're not supposed to operate because of NOx, um, which is currently not allowed um, because of this NOx issue. What we're doing is we're bumping up the NOx reduction to an extreme uh, efficiency level where um, those regions will not be forbidden anymore. So you can access those regions where, which are uh, fundamentally better for engine performance. Um, okay, and, and, and that really is just an issue of, of sort of real-time monitoring of the, of the NOx and then- Not just that, but some sort of control is not possible if you cannot differentiate multiple types of emissions. So, so NOx contains multiple individual components um, and also it needs to uh, distinguish between individual components of NOx. And this is something we can do. And NOx is nitrogen oxide. It contains like nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, all these other things. So you can, you have to be able to distinguish between these two things to be able to optimize this chemical reaction, uh, which, which is impossible to get with current sensors today because to them, everything looks the same. Even the thing that it reacts with ammonia, uh, which is a result of dissociation of urea in the exhaust, um, it looks the same to the sensor as well. So they can't even distinguish between what they're trying to reduce and then what they're reacting it with. So okay. the, the, the sensor, uh, the control system is super confused and it cannot be optimized as is. Okay. And then on, on this, uh, this Zephyr um, product that you, I guess that's your first product, right? The, the Zephyr monitoring system. Mm -hmm. um, so when you identify a, a truck that is, you know, basically out of compliance with, with what the regulations are. What's involved in sort of bringing that back into compliance? Is it, is it a matter of sort of tuning the engine or, or what has to be done? There's in some cases, the vehicle need to be decommissioned. I mean, when, <laughs> so it when, depends on the extent of what, what really happened because there are a lot of things that can trigger uh, higher knocks. Uh, one of them is uh, of course, um, you know, tampering with the exhaust system, which is easily, uh, not easy for the people who did it, they might get into trouble, like this is illegal and they will be fined for doing so. Um, but there is a correction method, like they can literally get a new after treatment system in, installed okay, in their truck. Um, so there's this thing called en like after treatment delete, which people do. And if they're caught, they have to do that. Um, and they will also be fined for doing so. Um, so this also creates this, um, because this exists, this is almost like a deterrent for uh, such behavior um, okay. that they will be caught. And if, if caught, this is um, very damaging financially to them. And then also um, if, if it is not something like that, if it's just something like um, age-related issue of the catalyst, they can just change the catalyst and individual components to get it fixed. There's, there are generally well-known solutions for these kinds of problems. I see. Okay. And um, speaking to some of the the other um, markets, other potential markets, there's a question about uh, leak detection at, say, a, a refinery or or another uh, yeah. chemical yeah. plant. Is is that something you're pursuing, and is that it within your capabilities? No, yeah, that's how we started actually. <laughs> Initially we were doing just leak detection. Um, we moved away from that a little bit because we found that market was a little bit, um, it, it has a high barrier to entry because of um, low willingness to pay for small leaks. So we're exceedingly good at finding small, uh, very difficult to measure things um, versus the other existing types of sensors. So uh, our value proposition made more sense in an application um, like this, but we, we definitely can do leak detection, except that people are um, not willing to find that many leaks, unfortunately, and <laughs> not willing to pay for that many leaks. So um, the, the business model didn't really work 
um, in that market that well. So we uh, we can still do it, and we can we can go back to that market when our uh, the cost per unit of our sensors have come down a little bit. Um, but at this point, at this price level, it didn't make it, make any sense for us to start there. Okay. And then uh, another question related to uh, Ignis um, from one of the audience members. So, do, do you anticipate that that would be um, that a, a truck manufacturer could incorporate that um, into the manufacturing stage of the truck, or is this something that you would that you would sell as an add-on? Um, no, we are we are thinking of starting at the manufacturing stage. Um, some of the new regulations that are coming that are um, explicitly. Um, targeting lower emissions. So the older existing trucks would not be subject to those upcoming regulations as soon as the new trucks would be. So we're targeting uh, application in those newer trucks. And then once we are out and about and scaled up, we can go back and um, do retrofitting uh, for the older generation trucks um, on the road. And it ultimately, you know, what, what's sort of the, the number of units you would be producing to sort of to address that that market? What's what's this ultimate scale that you're targeting for for Ignis? I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, that's dependent on what time, but um, ideally, we can make like millions of these sensors. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I guess the last question, sort of related, to, you you mentioned uh, seeking mentorship on the design for manufacturing. Um, what are some of the challenges that you've uh, identified related to that, just sort of mass producing this this technology? Well, uh, firstly, like there, this is a very new type of sensing technology. The the core elements of these sensor uh, they're not scaled up, so they're all subject to initial scaling problems, like something is not uniform, like uh, across a whole batch, um, stuff like that. Like, how do we standardize the manufacturing process of all these components? How do we standardize the assembly process? How do we automate a bunch of assembly parts? Um, like, how do we have a test uh, for intermediate stages? Um, all, all those things add up and and there are all these unanswered type questions that we're um, starting to answer. And, um, and, and we can see like, there would be a lot of these um, questions to be answered. And someone with some industry experience um, on trying to uh, create a new product line that involves um, complex geometry and assembly process would be really uh, helpful for us to uh, get there. Great. Um, yeah, it looks like there are at least a, a few attendees who, who might be interested in, in helping you with that. Um, so, uh, so I hope that uh, you can connect with them. Uh, Rito, thanks, thanks again for, uh, for sharing uh, Indrio with us this afternoon. Appreciate it. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks. Okay, so uh, finally, we will uh, finish with uh, cities. Uh, the last uh, venture today is called Kit Switch. Um, they are uh, addressing the problem of affordable housing and the environmental footprint of uh, construction of housing. Uh, so uh, one surprising fact um, that impacts their business model is that uh, there are uh, currently about 17 billion square feet of vacant non-residential buildings, uh, 6 billion of which are already zoned to allow for housing. Uh, so in one line, uh, Kit Switch enables adaptive reuse of underutilized commercial buildings into affordable housing. Uh, and we're joined by the founder of Kit Switch, uh, Armel Couton. Armel, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, really happy to be here um, and wonderful for, to hear from the other teams as well. All right. Can you see my screen? All right. Yes. Great. Thank you. Perfect. So hello all, my name is Armel. I'm here on behalf of my team at KidSwitch, where we design tools to turn the buildings we already have into affordable housing. So in the past year, you may have had to work remotely, shop online, or cancel much awaited travel plans. And while I know that we all hope that these habits are temporary, 
They also reflect increased vacancies for office, retail, and hospitality that existed before and will exist after the pandemic. And not only are these vacant buildings a deep pain point for property owners unable to get a return on their investment, but their upkeep and lost value is also a costly burden to uh, communities surrounding them. The pandemic has also emphasized the country's urgent need for housing. For every 100 low-income households, there are only 29 adequate housing options. And the construction industry, which suffers from labor shortages and lengthy timelines, has simply not been able to keep up with demand as it costs $500 to $700,000 just to produce one unit of housing in key urban areas. But what if we converted vacant buildings into housing? Um, as Matt mentioned, of the 17 billion square feet of currently vacant non-residential buildings in the US, 6 billion square feet are already zoned for housing. And so what that means is that developers don't even need to apply for rezoning in order to start building housing units. If we were able to convert uh, these 6 billion square feet of vacant buildings into housing, we could produce over 8 million units or enough to completely address our housing deficit. And developers are well aware of this opportunity, yet the process of adding interiors into existing buildings can still be confusing and lengthy. And that's where we come in. We're a team of architects, designers, and engineers with a strong commitment to building better. It's been such a pleasure to work with this team of talented women. Um, Alex studied construction in search of better ways to build housing in Sub-Saharan Africa, and she's also an awesome baker. Um, Anoush has been working as a lead AP architect for over six years, focusing on sustainability, human wellness. Um, and she's also a Zumba instructor and yoga enthusiast. Um, Sam studied civil engineering. She's really passionate about public transit and has coded some incredible data dashboards to help with food distribution and COVID response. Um, Candice is an engineer with a love for travel and she's been dedicated to putting her skills towards providing more just and more affordable housing. Together, we designed a panelized interior kit of parts. Its components are easy to manufacture, flat pack, and fit through an existing structure in order to set up a code compliant and energy efficient housing unit in under a day. And since our components are modularized, they're easy to reconfigure to suit changing needs and disassemble for end of life recyclability. Effectively, we design walls as a product where the system layouts for plumbing and electricity are already pre-engineered. These panels can then easily clip together on site and they serve as the building blocks to set up everything a housing unit might need. Our kit also simplifies the design process and it enables us to set up clear metrics to optimize for plumbing efficiency in an adaptive reuse scenario, as well as comfortable daylighting, ventilation and reduced plug loads for our living spaces. And so while our kit is perfect for conversions, it can also be used for new construction projects as a flexible non-structural interior solution that can be rearranged to grow with tenants, as well as same use retrofit projects as a more targeted tool for specific upgrades. Construction involves multiple stakeholders on a typical project, a developer will interface with an architect, general contractor, and maintenance team. And we integrate with this ecosystem by working as a component designer, outsourcing production to a manufacturer, and selling the kit to developers, in addition to providing unit design assistance to the architect, installation training to the general contractor, and user manuals to the maintenance team. So while we don't take on real estate purchasing, um, permitting, on-site work, and maintenance, we understand those areas well in order to best interface with our partners. So another advantage of a pre-designed kit is that instead of confusing timelines and creeping budgets, customers can view a single clear and upfront price per panel. In this way, they're also able to generate instant quotes based on kit bundles for their projects, and they can order additional parts if they wish to reconfigure their units. 
So let me take you uh, through a recent case study that we conducted um, in order to best understand uh, our product at work and all of the multiple benefits. So Amit Jordan, an affordable housing developer, they recently purchased and secured change of use permits for a distressed retail building. From there, they could request an initial assessment from Kitswitch, schedule a LIDAR scan for precise interior dimensions, and have the Kitswitch team work with a project architect to populate a 3D model with our components. And so once the developer gives us the green light for our layout, um, the general contractor can perform any necessary renovation system upgrades while the kit is being manufactured off site. Finally, it can be brought on site and 20 units could be installed in under two weeks. And so what does this mean for our developers triple bottom line? Um, so first taking a look at the economic implications. You know, typically a project like this would take a year, acquisition costs included, it would, it would cost about $250, $1,000 per unit. Um, there would also be some environmental implications. So uh, there would be some waste uh, generated from demolition and few sustainability metrics and accountability there. Similarly, there could be a lot of noise and dust uh, impact to the surrounding community and little design transparency on uh, how people really want their, to shape the units where they live. And so we could really change that by um, cutting nine months off of the timeline and enabling the developer to start generating rental income, effectively saving them $70,000 per unit. Our kit could also use, um, could also enable waste reduction for the project as well as already incorporated lead and well standards for sustainability. On top of making our uh, existing building stock more energy efficient and sustainable without having to demolish and rebuild those buildings. Finally, with minimal installation impact, our tool can also be used for participatory design, enabling people to play with the different components and craft their ideal housing units and foster a sense of placemaking where we're not constantly demolishing and rebuilding buildings, but where we're really enabling local communities to make use of the buildings they have. So a little bit about our journey and next steps. We joined um, the Tomcat Innovation Transfer Program shortly after starting our initiative at the end of 2020. And we set three types of goals for ourselves, coalition building, customer discovery, and product development. Since then, the Tomcat program has enabled us to form a network of support, engaging stakeholders at international conferences and being selected as one of the top 10 clean tech teams nationwide for the VentureWell program. Going forward, we welcome any legal support around incorporation, which is one of our next steps, as well as founder visa status. And we seek to build a sponsor network across supportive architects, engineers, and organizations. We've also been able through the Tomcat Center um, to generate a comprehensive data study of vacant buildings across the US to inform our commercialization and have collected intent for multiple pilot projects including the initial conversion of one office into a standard studio, three motel conversions, a 10-story office conversion, and the installation of 400 residential units across the second floor of a shopping mall. We've learned most from workshopping these uh, projects as case studies, and we'd welcome any additional projects that you think we would be a good fit for. So finally, we've also been able to research uh, different potential um, applications, uses, and designs for our kits through an in-depth building typology study, 3D printed mockups, and performing a life cycle analysis of our sustainability impacts. Going forward, we, we um, definitely welcome any recommendations for maker spaces and manufacturers, as well as an eventual product showcase location. I'm really proud of how far my team has come in the past few months and want to reiterate how incredibly uh, helpful the Tomcat Innovation Transfer Program was to where KidSwitch is today. Um, thank you so, so much for your time and attention today and I'd welcome any questions that you might have. Wonderful, thank you, Armel, for a really inspiring presentation. Um, 
you, you mentioned a, a couple of uh, commitments for pilots uh, at, at the last slide there. So is, is there a, um, we, where are you targeting some of your first projects? Is it local? Uh, it's right here in San Francisco or, or elsewhere in the US? Yeah, that's a really awesome question. And I think it highlights also um, one of the key challenges that we're mitigating for, which is being able to make these units code compliant and understanding local building code does take a fair amount of effort. And so to answer your question, we're focusing on California as of right now, but across different city typologies. So San Francisco, but also places like Fresno um, in order to uh, develop these pilot projects. Uh, so starting with the state of California. Okay. And uh, there's a couple of questions from the audience kind of around how you um, connect with um, developers and um, uh, how receptive developers are to this concept. So first of all, are, are there um, a lot of uh, developers who are really keen on developing affordable housing from these vacant buildings? Um, or does it take some convincing to um, to to get a developer to uh, to warm up to this idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when it comes to the pilot projects, we've really been focusing on a couple important points. The first one being affordable housing developers. So people who do have capital to develop housing, but are also mission oriented and share our goals and values. And then secondly, we've been focusing on uh, affordable housing developers that already own buildings. Uh, that are vacant. So they've either recently purchased distressed uh, motels because of um, the impact that the pandemic has had on those types of buildings, or uh, some property owners have owned an office building for up to 10 years and have been really struggling to lease um, those units and are deciding to switch to residential. So thus far, we've received quite a bit of traction just based on people who are already have already made that decision and are looking for a tool to make it happen. Um, and we think that you know by pursuing these successful pilot projects, we can show other more reluctant developers, which is important to note the construction industry um, is, you know, does move slowly when it comes to change and probably for good reason because we're building spaces that need to be safe for people. Right. But um, yeah. And, and have you um, identified, it will be a single manufacturer of the of the panel, or is there sort of a, a, a number of different parties that you have to interact with to produce that? Yeah, um, so we're looking at a manufacturer network. Um, effectively, our value add as a component designer is that we're bringing together a lot of trades that have usually been fragmented. And so there is no manufacturing facility today that can make every single component that we need in our panels, but we're strategically um, you know, targeting uh, metal frame manufacturers because that's kind of the, the box within everything uh, fits. And so targeting them and then partnering with any kind of mechanical, electrical, plumbing um, subcontractors and suppliers and having those parts shipped to the manufacturing facility is how we're planning to operate. So not a single manufacturer relying on a network and um, kind of building those connections across industry as a as a systems integrator. And there's a question around the cost. So the the costs that you showed are those are national averages. Um, that's that's one question. And then, what is the cost of of constructing a new housing unit that would that would enable you to uh, address this housing unit shortage for the seven and a half million um, people seeking affordable housing? What, uh, how much does it have to cost to, to, to be able to address that problem? Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to uh, walk through very briefly. I have a couple more visuals that detail the costs. Sure. Um, so just pulling those up really quickly. Um, when it comes to looking at how we stack up against traditional methods, you know, property owners will still have to purchase the building. And these were not based on averages. They were based on a case study of what we believe to be the most representative building typology. So working with developers who have a really strong understanding of costs, having done a lot of different projects. Um, traditionally, you know, a developer would have to take on permitting as well, get a custom design and use traditional construction methods. 
overall the process for this five story uh, retail building to 20 studio units would take about a year and the developer would have a 1% IRR leasing their units affordably. And so what we really change is that when it comes to those costs, you know, a developer still has to take on property acquisition, permitting, and system upgrades. And while our actual materials aren't that different in cost from traditional construction methods, we enable them to cut design time by half and also reduce on-site mistakes. The key here is the time component is because we can enable them to start leasing their units after three months and generating rental income, they're able to get an 8% IRR leasing their units affordably. So hopefully that answers the question of um, how does the cost that our solution changes a uh, change impact uh, the ability to produce affordable housing and that's really in the IRR and for property developers to be able to get a return. This is also independent of government grants which do help for affordable housing a fair amount. Um, did I answer every component? Perfect. Of that yeah, question? no, thank you. That was that was wonderful. Um, and then a, a question about so can can a municipality contact you? Can you work directly with them or do you do you have to go through um, a developer? Yeah, part of our go to market has really heavily emphasized forming partnerships with cities, uh, just recognizing the importance of aligned goals there. And when it comes to our actual customers, um, if anyone owns a building and wants to convert it, so that could also be a city through uh, some of their reclaimed properties or their city owned. deliver on that. So we've been working most closely with the cities of and uh, Fresno. Terrific. Um, well, uh, I, I want to take this uh, last minute here to uh, thank Armel again for uh, a, a wonderful presentation. Thank all of our teams today, um, Chase, Farmrays, and Rito from Indrio. Um, I hope this has given you a perspective of sort of the, the breadth of, of innovations in the sustainability space um, that are cultivated at, at Stanford and that we have the, the pleasure of, of helping to support uh, at the Tomcat Center. Um, I want to encourage you uh, again to, to reach out to our presenters and other attendees uh, through our LinkedIn uh, networking group, and uh, we certainly hope to See you at another uh, Tomcat event uh, in the future. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.